Hello, everybody. I'm Athrara Mothur, the Director of Legal Research at the Center for Art Law, and I'm so excited to welcome you to our event through words exploring the gap between law and justice. And on a side note and an interesting note, the image that we've actually used for the graphic for today's event has actually been AI generated using DALI 2 and a text front of a woman painting and a lady holding a justice scale. So in case you haven't had the chance, and just because um, we find it really fascinating, DALI 2 is available to the public and you can play around with it and create and use these images as well, which may have interesting implications for AI ownership and art. But anyway, that is a topic for another day and coming to today's session. At the outset, I would like to thank our speaker, Harbani, and a special thanks to Sarah and Just Breathe and ICAD, a human rights advocacy center for making this event possible and for working with us on this. Before I introduce our speaker for today, and as per usual, let me let you know a little bit about the Center for Art Law and what we do. We are a Brooklyn-based research and education nonprofit, and we are dedicated to offering resources and programming to advance the arts and law community. Through our website, our newsletter, our events, we disseminate information and we try to keep our audience updated on everything art law. News, programs, cases, publications, movies, and a lot more. And of course, this doesn't even begin to cover everything that we do, so we invite you to subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already to receive updates. We also share exciting stories of galleries, contemporary exhibits, and immersive art experiences on our Instagram and social media. So be sure to check those out. We have a lot of fun things lined up. You may also consider becoming a premium member to receive tons of offers and discounts for our events, as well as access to our case law corner articles and recordings of past events. We have a lot of those coming up this fall, including a webinar on bees for blockchain, a workshop on fan art and fair use, a primer on artist trusts, we have legal clinics on artist-dealer relationships and contracts on legacy and estate planning, where we pair artists and attorneys for one-on-one -on -one consultations. We also have a distinguished lecture on the Andy Warhol case as an in-person event in New York in December. So you can view all of these on our website and register for hopefully all of them so we can see more of you. A few of our housekeeping items. This program is being recorded for archival purposes, but as I mentioned, we would love to see you. So please feel free to keep your cameras on and your microphones muted for now. Once the video becomes available, we will send across a recording of the session and a survey for the event as well. If you have any questions for our speaker, we will have a question and answer session later. So you can put them in the chat box below. Now, finally, coming to our topic and our speaker for today. So we had talked about this before, but if you like poetry and if you've been on Pinterest and Tumblr, the chances are you might have caught a glimpse of blackout poetry floating around the internet. Blackout poetry, it's, it's poetry in which poets black out certain words or they redact words on pre-existing literature, leaving only a few very select words to create new meaning. This occupies more of an unusual space that crosses heavily between written composition, visual art, and crafting. It produces something that's new, that's different, creative, that's out of and apart from the original source material. Something to remember about a blackout poem is that the text and the redacted text form a sort of a visual poem. The words for blackout poems are already written before and they're taken from another text but it's up to the poet to bring new meaning and life to these words. Our speaker for today has created a very interesting way to visually understand legal issues and cases and challenges and make it easier for the world to understand the effect of a lot of critical legal cases through her blackout poetry. So do law and justice go hand in hand? Have court decisions taken us backwards? Or what role can the arts play in making the law more accessible? when law and legalese can be confusing and complicated and can, and can get stuck in our brain, poetry, it might be brief and it can go straight to the heart of the matter. So I'm so excited to finally introduce our speaker, Harbani Ahuja, an artist in residence at Human Rights Advocacy Center, ICAD, where she's developed Dicta, 
a poetry series created from redacting sections of key Supreme Court cases in the US. In addition to her work as an artist, Kurbani is a public interest attorney committed to serving marginalized community, communities and advocating for human rights. She is currently counsel at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, working on economic justice and reducing the racial wealth gap. So without any further ado, we're all so excited to hear from you, Harbani. I will let you have the Zoom screen now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azaria, for the wonderful introduction. And nice to meet all of you. Um, I'm really excited for our discussion today. So as mentioned, my name is Harbani Gorahuja, and I'm a public interest attorney, a poet, and an artist. Um, I've been involved in several legal policy um, and advocacy efforts in several areas of law, including um, civil rights, immigrant rights, um, and public health. And I've worked for um, nonprofit organizations as well as government organizations. So um, until recently, I was actually serving as the senior legislative counsel for the committees on immigration, health, hospitals, and the Subcommittee on COVID Recovery and Resiliency at the New York City Council. Um, and in that role, I drafted legislation um, and worked on policy and oversight of city agencies. Um, and I recently just started as um, an Economic Justice Council with the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Um, I'm also, as mentioned, an, ad, um, an artist in residence with the International Center for Advocates Against Discrimination, or ICAD, um, in their Artivism program. Um, and ICAD really took me on as their first artist in residence um, back in 2020. And I've partnered with them to formally create my, pro, uh, my project, which is entitled DICTA. Um, I've been really grateful to be able to partner with such an amazing organization. And I'm really grateful to be um, part of the Artivism program, which really seeks to elevate underrepresented artists um, and provide them with a lens of structural discrimination um, in which to view their art through. Um, so a little bit about myself. Now I'll let you know a little bit more about the project we'll be talking today, which is DICTA. DICTA was very much born out of my love for poetry. I became interested in poetry at a very young age. Um, I would love to read and write poetry. Um, and as I grew older, I sort of fell in love with the idea of using poetry as a means of furthering activism. Um, and that's something that really inspired me because poetry is really just a beautiful, simple way to connect with people. Um, the law, however, is not. <laughs> um, and I, I'd love to do a little exercise with y'all today. So if you could think of a word, um, the, the first word that comes to your head when you think of the word law. So how many of you thought of the word simple or the word accessible? I don't think any of you thought of that, right? Um, so you're not alone. I think, you know, most people find the law very difficult to understand. Um, it's very complex. It's very inaccessible. It's filled with complicated legal jargon and legalese. You don't really pick up a Supreme Court decision and read it for pleasure. It's just not something people do. Um, I don't do that either, and I'm an attorney. So I think, you know, that was one of the main driving factors for this project. I wanted to make the law more accessible, easier to understand, um, and easier to read. And uh, so going back to the exercise, how many of you may have thought of the word justice or the word fairness? Some of you, yeah. So that was sort of the second driving factor for my project. I think because the law is so complex um, and hard to understand, we often just assume that it's correct, it's right, it's just, um, and it's not. So um, I think that was one of the, the other driving factors for this project. I think we're we're trained to sort of think of the law in this way by society. Um, so that you know the symbol for the legal field is Lady Justice. She's holding a scale in one hand. She's blindfolded, um, and it sort of puts this image in our heads that the law is fair, the law is just and blind. It's not. Um, we often, you know, we call our criminal legal system the criminal justice system, even though there's a lot of justice lacking there. Um, 
So throughout this discussion, I really want you all to think about this gap that exists between the law and justice. And I want you to consider that for a lot of marginalized groups in this country, um, throughout this country's history, the law has even been a system of oppression for folks. Um, so I've been talking a lot about dicta, but really what is dicta? So dicta seeks to unearth the essence of Supreme Court decisions by illuminating the broader societal context in which they were written. So the process is pretty simple. I select a, key, uh, a Supreme Court case um, and we select a page from a case and I cross out everything except some words and then those words form a poem. Um, people will often ask me what the title of this project means, like what is dicta? Um, there are various components that make up a court's decision. Um, and that those include things like the facts in question, the factors that are underlying the rule in the case, um, and the holding which applies the rule to the facts of the case. Dicta is essentially additional commentary that's made by judges um, that often goes beyond the factual circumstances of the case and provides a lot of critical insights into specific legal issues. So my poetry in essence here is providing that additional commentary, but from the lens of a public interest advocate, um, a woman of color and a poet. So I partnered with ICAD to develop my dicta series um, with poems focused in several thematic areas. Uh, the first three of these themes have already been released in an interactive virtual exhibition. Um, and those are the rights of women, the rights of black people and the rights of immigrants. Um, we're also working on uh, two other themes, which will be coming soon, which are the right to love and um, indigenous people's rights. So, we chose the themes, uh, these themes specifically because they tie together social justice issues that I'm really passionate about and care deeply about. Um, and they're also reflective of the organization's programmatic work. So um, we sort of carefully curated a lot of the case law um, within each of those themes so that it would be representative of a wide range um, of issues that go back to the country's early history uh, to really illuminate the ceaseless struggle for human rights in this country and also some of the progress that we've made over time. Um, so I'd love to share some of the poems with you. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. One second. Can y'all see that? Okay, great. So when you go to the dicta page, it's dicta.icad.go, um, you will see this page and it will sort of, oh, sorry, it's like loading. Okay, so it'll show up like this. And this is a place where you can engage with the rest of the poetry, but we're just going to do a couple, a couple of readings today. So um, this is the timeline of all of the poems and you can sort it at the bottom here by immigrant rights, rights of black people and women's rights. So we'll start with a poem from the rights of black people series. Um, and we're going to talk through a poem that um, you all might be very familiar with. Um, it's sort of one of the um, historic uh, poems that, that is very well known and you read about when you're you know taking a social studies class for example so um this poem uh i'll read it first and then we'll we'll talk a little bit about the context so this one's dred scott v stanford supreme court 9, 1857. notice that the constitution was made exclusively by and for the white race as white people were left the power to determine who shall be citizens of the United States, the power to deem who is even a person at all. So um, this case was filed by Dred Scott on the grounds that of, of wrongful enslavement. Um, he brought this case on the grounds 
that residence in a free territory meant that he and his family were free um, and they couldn't be re-enslaved. And the Supreme Court in this case ruled that Black people, free or enslaved, could never enjoy the rights of American citizens. Um, so something that you don't typically learn when you read this case is that the Chief Justice um, here, who infamously penned, uh, infamously, excuse me, penned the majority opinion, um, was actually born into a wealthy family of enslavers. Um, so another thing you don't typically learn is that the ruling was actually quite indicative of the political dynamics at the time, um, which really used states' rights arguments to ensure that the American economy could continue to rely on enslavement for labor. Um, in the poem that I created here from this case, I wanted to really draw attention to this point that a group of, you know, nine white men and enslavers were actually writing this decision. Um, so uh, I hope that, you know, you can see sort of like what I'm trying to draw out um, through the poetry and sort of um, look at what is happening within the society around the time that these decisions are being made. Um, so that we can get a more broad view of what the law looks like. So next we'll turn to um, a decision from the Rights of Women series. And this is one that I'm sure you're all familiar with because we've been talking about it a lot lately um, as it's been in the news quite a bit. And this is Roe v. Wade, um, Supreme Court, 1973. How is it that at the time of the adoption of our constitution, a woman enjoyed a substantially broader right to terminate a pregnancy than she does in most states today. The anti-abortion mood prevalent in this country played a significant role in the enactment of stringent criminal abortion legislation that regards a child before birth as a living being with inherent rights while it fails to recognize and denies all protection to the human life that the child may be born to. Um, so this case um, was filed in Texas because Texas law um, only allowed for um, abortion for the purpose of saving the life of the mother. And Roe at the time argued that the law was unconstitutional because it violated the guarantee of personal liberty and the right to privacy, which is guaranteed in the Constitution. Um, no, it's not. The court concluded that during the first trimester, um, the government could not place uh, restrictions on a woman's ability to abort a pregnancy. Um, and in the years following this decision, states actually passed over a thousand abortion restrictions because of the way in which this decision was um, written. Um, and then as, you, as many of you probably know, on June 24th of this year, the Supreme Court actually overturned Roe v. Wade in uh, the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization case. Um, and that really ended 50 years of precedent, uh, which constitutionally protected the right to an abortion. Um, the reversal will likely result in about 26 states um, in the US imposing significant restrictions or just outright, abort uh, outright banning abortion, um, which will really deny the fundamental right to healthcare and bodily autonomy for millions of women in the US. Um, in this poem, I really wanted to point out that we are essentially going backwards um, in this country in terms of women's reproductive rights. Um, so from the time that the Constitution was written to now, um, and ironically, it's gotten worse this year. Um, and all of these restrictions um, have, you know, the effect of really granting rights to um, an unborn fetus while stripping away the right, the same rights from the human that is that that child may be born to. So that's what I hoped to um, point out with this specific poem. So next we will turn to the Immigrants Rights series um, and we'll be talking about um, Korematsu, the United States. 
Cormato of the United States, Supreme Court, 1944. The imprisonment of a citizen in a concentration camp solely because of ancestry is unjustifiable, ugly racial prejudice, which was inevitably justified by the court, Congress, and the president. The Constitution means nothing in war. So in this poem, um, this poem is about um, a, a case specifically about Japanese internment in uh, the US. So Fred Korematsu, um, who was the plaintiff in this case, was a 23-year-old Japanese American citizen um, when President Roosevelt signed an executive order authorizing armed forces to remove people of Japanese ancestry to internment camps following the attacks on Pearl Harbor in 1942. Um, and this caused a relocation of about 120,000 plus people to 26 detention camps, um, some of which were in very, very harsh conditions. Um, and Korematsu didn't comply with the order. He changed his name, he altered his appearance, he claimed to be of Hawaiian and Spanish descent. The FBI ended up arresting him um, and he was convicted of violating military orders um, and he was sent to an internment camp. The ACLU uh, represented him and appealed this case to the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Supreme Court ruled 6-3 that Korematsu's detention was not based on race, but was instead, uh, instead it constituted a quote unquote military necessity, um, which is very ridiculous if you think about it. And I'd love for you guys to think about whether something like this could happen today. And this is something I think about often. Um, and, you know, just in our recent past in 2018, Justice Sotomayor actually argued in her dissent of the Trump v. Hawaii uh, Muslim travel ban case that the court was using the same dangerous logic that they used in this case to justify a ban on nationals from certain Muslim majority countries from entering the US. Um, and they were solely based on race or religion. And so um, Justice Roberts in that case said that Korematsu had no place um, in law in the US under the constitution, uh, which a lot of people saw as the overturning of this case, but it, it could be argued that Trump v. Hawaii is really just the same doctrine under a different name. Um, so those are some of the poems that are on the Dicta series. I encourage you all to look through. I mean, there's a bunch here, so I don't want to, um, I don't have time to go through all of them today, but um, I hope that you uh, are able to, you know, look at the complete series um, on the website and you can take a look at each of the themes there, um, listen to each poem um, and watch uh, the words really highlighted on the page to form the poem um, and read background at the bottom um, on the case uh, for each poem. So my hope here um, for this project is that it helps you all connect with the law in a more meaningful way um, and really recognize that there is a gap that exists between the law and justice and that the law and legal systems have often been used as a system of oppression for uh, marginalized communities in this country. Um, the law at the end of the day, if we think about it, is really just a reflection of what people in power, people who sit on our legislatures, people who sit on our courts deem to be morally right and wrong. Um, and it's no secret that, you know, throughout American history and even to this day, the majority of the people in power who sit on those positions are, you know, white men. Um, so, you know, this project really helped me dig deeper um, and think about the law in a new and holistic way. Um, and I hope become a better lawyer. Um, and I really hope that, you know, people engaging with this project really see the timeliness uh, for the struggle for human rights in this country and recognize that it's still a struggle that continues today. Um, you know, it's been, there are, there are certain groups that are highlighted here that have um, faced various struggles throughout this country's, you know, since this country's foundation. And a lot of those struggles 
are still continuing today. So um, I hope that, you know, we can look at the law in a new way um, through this project. And I hope that, you know, together we can sort of envision what a more just and equitable legal system um, should look like. Um, so thank you uh, so much for taking the time to engage with DICTA. And, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Harbadi. Uh, to the audience, if you have any questions or if you have any thoughts, um, feel free to put them in the chat box or if you'd like to or if you'd like to speak and unmute your microphones to discuss anything, we'd we'd love to hear that as well. But um, maybe just before we get into that, um, Harvani, it's it's so wonderful to hear about uh, all of the poetry that you've been working on and the particular topics that you've chosen for your series. And I think it's extremely helpful that at the end of each of your poems, you give the context of it to explain um, the background of the case, the poem itself, and then an actual link to the opinion. So I just wanted to ask with um, the work that you've done so far and putting law and poetry together, um, have you been able to, to find a way to see whether more people have maybe been interested in these poems or in these topics, do you think, um, visualizing the law through art or through poetry has been more impactful or there's really no way to to get numbers or to see or to assess the impact of it yeah I think I mean I think it is difficult to assess the impact but you know anyone who I've interacted with through this project um, has told me that they really enjoyed sort of the way in which um, we're viewing the law through the lens of art um, and I think that it really helps people connect with um, the law itself because, like I said, it is very complex and people don't like to read it because it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't make sense when you're um, just reading a legal opinion, you get lost in it. And so I feel like um, I didn't want to just make the law more accessible, but I also really wanted to pull out, like I said, a lot of the background of what's happening within case law, because a lot of people will just read a case and say, okay, this is this is the law, like this is how it is. Um, but we really should challenge that notion and think about, you know, why why certain decisions are made and why they're made at specific times in, in our history. And so um, I, I hope that, um, you know, people are engaging with the law in, in a new and interesting way and that um, it helps us think through building more equitable systems in the future. Thank you so much, Herbani. That's wonderful. We're getting a couple of comments and um, some questions in the chat as well. So one of the questions that have come in is, do you ever read through a case or an article and then notice it would make a good base for a blackout poem? Or maybe in general, what's your process for deciding which is a good <coughs> case? Yeah. To that's a great question. I think um, that has happened from time to time. I um, remember back in law school, I was reading um, this case, LA v. Lyons, which is actually on the um, dicta platform. It's under the Rights of Black People series. Um, and at the time, um, uh, Eric Garner had just um, been killed. And so it really just struck me when I was reading that case um, that there was a lot of similarities um, regarding, you know, police brutality against um, the black community. And so that one, when, as I was reading it, I saw an opportunity there to write something. I think otherwise, generally what we like to do is we'll, um, so with, with the ICA team, we've selected specific themes um, that are just important to us. Um, and we think we should highlight the struggle for human rights um, within those communities across time. So I think within those, um, we try to pick cases that um, were diverse. Um, so hit on a diverse number of issues within that space. And then also, um, A, you know, talked about some of the, the that struggle that I mentioned for human rights in this country, but also some of the ones that highlighted some of the progress that we've made over time. Um, and you know case law is uh is ever changing and so none of these are really set in stone um so i think it's interesting like for example we wrote uh, i wrote roe v wade before the decision came down this year and so when i went back and read it 
for myself, I was like, wow, this is very ironic that it just continues to get worse. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important that dicta is, you know, this like living sort of project where it will continue to change over time because the law changes over time. Um, and so back to your question, yes, I think, you know, there, are, there have been a couple, a couple of cases where we've done it that way, but for the majority of it, we, we try to specifically pick cases that really highlighted a timeline um, over this country's history. Thank you so much. I think that that really answers the question well. Um, we have another question in two. Are there other art mediums you have been drawn to in the legal space? Or what are your thoughts on collaborating with artists in different mediums to explore more of these impactful and powerful topics? Yeah, I mean, I love art. I, you know, grew up like, as a sort of creative, I don't know how I ended up in this field. Um, but I love like on the side doing, you know, like graphic design and writing and, um, you know, just doing a lot of like art uh, related things. So I think, you know, I would love to collaborate with other people. I, you know, I'm very into that. I also, um, aside from blackout poetry, I also try to write um, some poetry on just like, um, you know, activism related issues. So, you know, like some poems that I've written are, are about the law or about, um, you know, how like immigrant rights and things like that. So I do um, write, you know, just regular poetry as well, in addition to um, this, but I also am happy to always collaborate with folks because I think, you know, um, there's so many talented people out there and I'd be, you know, happy to, um, sort of work together on um, exploring, you know, important issues together. Thank you. Um, one of the other questions that came in, where have you tackled some, any of the cases dealing with pollution or climate change, or is this something that you'd be looking into as well? That's a great topic. We haven't um, specifically worked on pollution or climate change. It was one of the topics that we considered um uh you know doing for this project um but we sort of landed on on a number of others there are so many topics out there that we could touch on um but that that hopefully in the future that is something that i would love to do thank you and um do you plan on doing public readings of your poems as well or do you find more power in the visual aspect of your work and i think this may also tie into maybe something that we had mentioned during the introduction of today's session, how um, blackout poetry, more than just uh, written art, it seems to be more of visual art as well. So what would your thoughts be beyond this, Tara? Yeah, I, I mean, the reason I created it as blackout poems is because I really wanted people to connect with it as being a page from a Supreme Court decision. Um, so I think the visual aspect is really important to me. Um, I like doing readings. I, I often do readings like I did today at, you know, when I do a presentation on dicta, um, just so, you know, I think it adds an extra layer of um, interest to the to the reading. Um, actually, on the dicta website, we had several folks volunteer to do readings for a lot of the poems. So when you go on the website, you can actually hear it read out loud. Um, and I think it does add, you know, uh, an extra layer of interest to to the experience. Thank you. And I know you had mentioned this um, a little earlier, but some of our audience members, they joined in a little late. And um, we were wondering if you could uh, very briefly tell us once again, what inspired you to come up with the idea of blackout poetry? Sure. Um, and I think I can touch on a little more. Um, I gave a brief description, but I, I think, you know, broadly, it was because I I love poetry. I love writing poetry. I've been writing poetry since I was a little kid. Um, and when I got to law school, I, um, you know, that you start taking legal writing in your first year of law school and they very, they tell you right away, they're like, we're going to break down everything you've ever learned about writing and we're going to build it up again because law legal writing is very different than creative writing. And so part of me was like, oh no, I'm going to lose my creative writing abilities. Um, and so, you know, I was. I was spending all my days really just reading textbooks with like cases upon cases. And so 
for me, it was sort of like um, a creative exercise to try to find poetry there. Um, so that's really how it started. I, it, I started this project while I was in law school um, and reading cases and just, you know, doing some doing this for fun uh, to try to to find something out, create something else, something creative out of the cases. And then it really evolved into a more, um, you know, uh, sort of interesting project in the way that before I was just trying to find like fun poems within the cases. And then I was like, wait, we can make some commentary here. So it turned into more of like a, or of an exercise where I was trying to to dig deeper into the case and see why that that case was written in that way um, and what we could pull out of it. So um, that's how it really evolved over time. It was sort of a combination of my love for law and poetry. That's wonderful, thank you. And some more questions. Um, the Roe versus Wade poem that you created, uh, one of our audience members said that it's, it is very relevant even with the changing environment, but they're curious to know if you created Roe versus Wade today, would you do it differently? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I would. I think that I think the opinion still stands because I think the point I was trying to bring out there is that over time, um, since this since the founding of the Constitution, um, and the foundation of this country, the women's reproductive rights have only been taken away over time. And that that has continued this year. And I think, you know, I'm hoping I can work on the Dobbs decision as well. But, um, you know, I, I definitely think that um, when I read it, read it back after the decision came down this June, I was like, wow, this is still very relevant, which is sad, but it's, true <laughs> so thank you and um what comments have you encountered from readers from the legal persuasion like for judges oh i haven't spoken to any judges i don't know that they would be happy about this, but um i you know i joking aside i think everyone who i've spoken to in the legal profession broadly has has enjoyed it because I think it helps us look at the law in a different way. You know, we're used to when you go to law school, you're very much trained to look at the law in a very specific way. You find the facts in the case, you sort of dissect the case, right? You find the facts, you find the issue, you find the whole ding, and then you apply that rule forward. And we get stuck in this way of thinking, like, because, you know, there's this, um, there's this uh, principle in in the legal field called um, stare decisis, where generally if you if there's a case, you you know, that rule will apply in the future to all future cases. And so we, we don't think outside the box as lawyers, a lot of the time, because we're so sort of constrained in our field by what has happened before. Um, and so I think this is a creative way to really challenge how we think about the law and and challenge how you know challenge us to think about how we can envision a more equitable system legal system in the future um, because that i don't think that's something we do very often thank you another one of the questions do you think it's it's easy or um it works all right to balance yourself as as a lawyer and an artist do you find it challenging at times or you're able to manage yeah that's a great question i think this this project has helped me balance it because i'm able to do you know um to look at the law in a creative way um but yeah i think like i said like i think law um is like, sort of like a very um serious very uh you know rigid sort of field um you're expected to do things a very specific way legal writing is nothing like creative writing and so um it is sometimes challenging um but i think like when you're working in that kind of environment all day and then to like be able to to do something creative at the end of the day is a nice outlet so wonderful thank you 
And um, as another question, as an attorney, while you've been working or while you've been working on cases or arguing, have there ever been any instances while you're in the process where you think that, oh, maybe this could make a better poem? I'm sorry, could you say that again? You broke up a little bit on my end. Oh, so sorry. The question that came in was that as an attorney, while you're working on these cases and um, maybe while you're arguing or so forth, has there ever been a situation where you're like, oh, this would make a better poem? Oh, <laughs> that's funny. So I actually haven't worked on a ton of specific cases. I don't really, I don't work within like the litigation space. I'm, uh, I do a lot of policy work um, and I previously I was a legislative attorney, so I write law. Um, and I think that um, working on this project, I think really helped me be a better legislative attorney because I was thinking more deeply about how the laws that I was writing would impact larger communities over time. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think it helped this working on dicta simultaneously was really helping me become a better lawyer and thinking about the law in a better way. Um, yeah, so I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't worked on any cases like that, but yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. And uh, do you have any plans about other series or any topics that you're hoping to cover in the, in the near future? Yeah, so we have two topics that will be coming up soon, which are the right to love um, and the right uh, indigenous people's rights. So those will be those will be coming um, soon with uh, within this project with ICAD. Um, and then we'll see what the future holds. So if you know, I have the opportunity to work on themes in the future, I would I would love to do that. Um, because this is, you know, a really fun, creative way to engage with something that I'm passionate about. Oh, and thank you so much. There's another question. I think this ties in well to something uh, that I was thinking of since when we had spoke, you told me how you do a lot of policy work. So one of the questions that have come in is, do you think that blackout poetry would work for policy and or commentary that is associated with legislation? Yeah, I think po I think blackout poetry could totally work with legislation um, as well. I feel like it would be a little more dry because <laughs> having written laws, they're very like, you know, boring. Um, not boring, but like, you know what I mean? There's not like creative language that you can find in them very often. So, um, which is why I landed on Supreme Court decisions, which often can also be very dry. You know, I've, I've came across decisions that I wanted to work on that, you know, had a good point of law, but I just like could not find language in them to, um, you know, create something that was meaningful. So, um, you know, it's, it's a struggle sometimes <laughs> with, with legal language, but um, we make it work. Thank you so much. Um, oh, another interesting question. It's about your website design and if you plan to publish your work in a book. Oh, so we were very grateful to our partners um, that sponsored um, the website and y'all is a, is a creative agency that put it together. So a huge shout out to them. Um, I think it came out wonderfully um, and it has really great, um, you know, it, it's very interactive and it has a lot of really interactive pieces that I think make it fun to like sort of look at. So um, they did an excellent job and really anything beyond what my what my imagination could uh, could have for the because in for me, it was just, you know, an image um, and they were able to turn it into sort of like a virtual um, experience where you're able to really see the words lifted off the page. So a huge shout out to iCAD and y'all and all the all the folks that really sponsor that website. I would love to put this in a book. I think it would read um, well in a book as well, because I mean, even though they're more, more still images, I think um, we have explored doing that. We travel, uh, well, we're hoping to travel with this exhibition, um, but we're doing prints and um, one of the law offices in New York, Clifford Chance actually hosted us. Um, so we have, we had all of the prints, um, displayed there and we had pretty good uh, you know, feedback from that. So we're hoping that we can make it a more, a, a traveling exhibition. Um, so I think, yeah, hopefully a book, we'll see what, what it, where the project takes us. Thank you so much. And um, 
also, have, have you thought of covering, right now I know that you're focusing on US cases and US legislation. Have you thought about covering international cases? Uh, is that something on your radar as well? It's a good question. I haven't at the time, um, just because I've studied US law. So to me, it was, you know, important to, um, you know, highlight the, the struggle for human rights in, in the country, you know, that I studied law and that I, that I call home. Um, I haven't thought about doing that with other, other cases, but maybe, maybe sometime in the future. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, are there any other questions from the audience? If anybody would like to send them in or if you would just like to um, unmute or speak up, please feel free to do that as well. Hi, Harani. Um, my name is James, we met earlier. Um, I have a question for you about um, those in the legal profession um, who are, you know, just like really trying to hold on to that creative spark um, as me, myself, one of those individuals. And I mean, you talked about this earlier, um, what other practices or like, um, I don't know, maybe um, exercises do you recommend for people trying to cultivate that creative spark, trying to hold on to it, although they're working like, you know, a more rigid, more structured profession that doesn't really allow for creativity. Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's hard, I think. Um, you know, for me, at least at the end of the day, I like, I like to do something creative if I have the time, but it's also difficult. You have to make time. Um, but sometimes for me, it's just like when something strikes me, like some creative things just strikes me, I'm like, oh, let me write this down. Um, and then I'll try to work on that. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, doing anything creative at the end of the day, I think it's also just like very healing for people that work in public interest spaces because that work can be really hard and draining. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, painting or, or writing or anything and uh, that you can do at the end of the day that sort of helps you, you know, vent, but also like feel creative, I think is, is helpful. I think a lot of my poetry that that before I started the dicta was very much just like, um, based on things I was seeing um, in my work. So like, you know, I used to work in the immigrant rights space. And a lot of the poems that I was writing at the time were, you know, based on that they were about immigrants. And so, you know, I think trying to trying to draw um, sort of, you know, from your experiences, in out in the world and in your work um, and trying to figure out a way to to make that um, creative is is a uh, it's challenge but it's challenging but I think it's it's um, it's the way in which you create the best the best work because I think you know your work more than anyone else thank you thank you so much and um, maybe so we hear from a couple of, of other people. I also just wanted to say that um, a lot of the topics that you cover on and to kind of relate to what we've been doing, especially on immigration, it can be so tough to get an audience interested in immigrant rights, especially with a couple of the sessions that we posted on visas. And I, I personally think that putting it in a way such as through poetry or art, it definitely has more power and it may make more number of people interested to attend events, to hear more about it, and to see how they can help. So it's exciting to think that you're picking up these topics that sometimes a lot of a lot of people don't act on or take interest in. So it's it's very appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, I think it really does, you know, sort of give folks um, a different way to sort of, it's a way to connect with people in a different way, right? Like, I feel like sometimes we think about like politics and like, leg, you know, legislation and law and like, it's, it's nobody wants to engage with that because it's just so complicated and it doesn't feel, um, it doesn't feel human sometimes. And so I think poetry or art is a really great way to really connect with people emotionally um, so they can see an issue through a more human lens. I love that. Thank you so much, Harbani. And Sarah, yes, please go ahead. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, hi. Yeah, I am uh, from ICAD. Uh, and Harbani, thanks so much for your wonderful, wonderful presentation and for yeah, answering all of everyone's uh, questions. Um, 
I just wanted to kind of uh, dovetail, I guess, off of what Achea was was saying, and I know for for me personally, uh, having studied a lot of these cases at a high level uh, in school, I kind of forgot what they were about. And I think now, after having you know gone through the dicta site, if someone mentions something, I can actually summarize the case and kind of talk about it, and it's top of mind because the way that you've kind of created these these poems, you, they really stick with you. Um, so I was wondering if the way that you talk about law and the way that you talk about um, cases or even the work that you do has kind of shifted as a result of this process? Because I, I know that even the way that I think I, I think about it has, has changed a bit. Yeah, thank you, that's, that's very kind. I think I similarly feel the same way. I think a lot of these cases, when I started working on them, I was like, oh, these are very seminal cases that I learned in law school. So like, I know what they're about, but I don't really know what they were about um, until I really started dig digging deeper. Like I knew Dred, what D Dred Scott that we just uh, read earlier was about, but I didn't like really think about, you know, cause we don't learn, you don't learn the history of the case. So you don't learn that like who wrote the decision, like what their, history is like you, you don't think about these things when you're learning a case in school you're just focused like I said so much on like the words on the page and so um yeah I definitely have been thinking about the law in a very different way since I started working on this project because I think it's it's also it's also really um made me think about how the law is really just you know it's written by people like us and you know if you know, our institutions or legal institutions, our legislatures, our courts were more diverse, had more diversity of thought and more diversity of experience. I think, you know, we'd have a more just, you know, society, but unfortunately they're not right now. Um, and so I think, I hope that, you know, this sort of sparks that discussion in the future because um, a lot of what, a lot of what we see in the legal field is really just a reflection of, of what the people in power um are thinking <laughs> thank you so much once again herbani any other questions from the audience at this point i think you've answered so much and you've given such a wonderful <laughs> presentation questions kept coming in and um they were just in our in our minds but this has been incredible herbani thank you so much for taking the time out, speaking with us, sharing your poems. And I'm not sure if you've done a recitation before, but hearing you and um, seeing visually the poems that you had on your website, it was wonderful. And we're so happy that you were able to, to do this. And I just wanted to thank you and Sarah and ICAD for putting this together with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it was really wonderful talking to all of you and thank you for all of the thoughtful questions and I really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we have sent the handout and the materials for today so you can um, take a look at Harbani's Instagram, her page. You can take a look at ICAD, see the other work that they do and uh, we'll all be waiting for your book, Harbani. <laughs> We're gonna wait for a publication and um, hopefully we will, we will have a chance to talk to you soon again. Thank you once again. And thank you to everybody who joined us today and for sharing your questions and um, making this a very interesting discussion about law, art and so much more. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Harbani. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.